Right, I want a fast lap and fast answers. Okay, let's do it. Clarkson, how long mate? Ooh. So this was it. This is where Top Gear was filmed. I even saw Chris Harris. He was here on the same day. I remember looking at him thinking, I feel really bad because that dude ain't going to get it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to comment on that. Oh, I, I like them the same. Well, whatever. The year, 2016. The place, Dunsfold Aerodrome. Top Gear are going through their biggest evolution in decades. So out goes Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May, and in comes a whole fresh lineup of talent, including Rory Reid. And today I'm going to speak to the gentleman himself and find out a little bit about what it was like to host the world's biggest motoring show, how he became the host of Auto Trader, and generally just find out a little bit about what makes him tick. And speak of the devil. Hello, Al. What are you doing? Uh, well, we've got a bit of work to do. We're doing a drag oh. race in a minute. Oh, OK. Yeah. More importantly, before that, I'm here to do something different. You want to promote your podcast, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yes. Show on the road. Everybody needs to tune in. Um, what's it about? Well, we match a celebrity with a car chosen specifically for them based around their lives and their stories. So where was my invitation? Are you a celebrity? <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Fair play, all right. This uh, is your invitation. This is my invitation. Okay, all right, jump in then. We'll go down memory lane, shall we? All right. So, how did you end up on Top Gear? Jeremy Clarkson. So he punched, you can thank him by the way, he punched the producer in the face, a guy called Osh. Um, it's a real like sliding doors moment because whatever his reason was for it, if he didn't have that reason and he didn't do that, then none of this would be happening right now. Wow. So he did what he did. The BBC said, we're not going to renew your contract. And Hammond and May followed him. And that meant Top Gear needed some new presenters. So they hired... Chris Evans, they paired him up with, or rather he paired himself up with Matt LeBlanc, Joey from Friends. Sounds a bit surreal. Yeah. Gets more surreal though, because they also handpicked Eddie Jordan, F1 team boss, um, and Sabine Schmitz as well. And they had space for one more person. So the way they did it was they put it out on the internet and the newspapers and the magazines and the TV show saying, we are looking for a Top Gear presenter <laughs> and we are going to open it up to absolutely anybody who wants to apply. All you have to do is send in a 60 second audition tape and we'll consider you. And I remember I was told over 15,000 people from all over the world auditioned. Wow. I remember talking to other car journalists, like we were like traveling the world, like reviewing cars. I mean, basically anyone who says that they were a car journalist and didn't apply for Top Gear is probably lying. Yeah. Most people applied for that job. <laughs> so what was your showreel like? Do you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll play it. All right, here it is. I'm probably going to regret this, but this is my anti-audition. Don't hire me because I'm an expert. I'm a car journalist. I've driven everything from an Austin to a Zetros. I can tell a V8 from a V12 from a mile away. Boring stuff. Hire me because I can tell stories well. I can explain what the numbers mean, how they make you feel, how a box on wheels can shape an adventure, and I can do it in a way that's engaging, relatable, and cool. If Clarkson and Idris Elba had a love child, that would be me. So if that sounds appealing on any level, then get in touch. That is brilliant. So, <laughs> it's a bit different. <laughs> uh, the love child of Idris Elba and Jeremy Clarkson. It sounds stupid now, doesn't it? But it got yes. their attention. Yeah, did, it, did they? comment on, on that? Um, do you know, I've never spoken to Clarkson to this day. Idris Elba, I met Idris Elba at like a BBC function and he was working the room. I remember him coming up to my little bit where I was and he goes, so what do you do? And I go, oh yeah, I'm one of the new Top Gear presenters. And he looked me dead in the eye and he went, I wanted that job. And then mm. he walked off. For real? <laughs> he just walked off. And I was like, oh, was he joking? I wasn't really, I'm still not sure to this day. So, um, may, I don't know, maybe he was just being dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really funny memory of you when we were doing a show and we're sitting in the back of a Range Rover or, or some sort of 404 
but you yes. were wearing a pink baby romper as part of the shoot. I think it might have been baby blue. I'm yes. not sure. And I, and it was chucking it down with the rain. It was such a surreal moment, but I remember, I don't know why we were talking about it, but you saying then that you really, really, really wanted to become a presenter on Top Gear. Yeah. You were like manifesting it. Yeah, definitely, 100%. Do you know what? Like when you do a job that so closely mirrors your dream job, when you get an opportunity to mm. do it and it seems even semi-realistic, I think you've got to put it out into the universe and yeah. just believe in yourself that that is possible. So how did you then get your foot in the door? Right, so I sent in my audition tape, but I was like laser focused on this. So I, I got in touch with like producers at the BBC saying, you know when you do like a cover letter to support your 60 second tape, I did that. Um, saying how good I was and how much I thought it, that I, I, I thought that I suit the role. And um, I also got in touch with um, Sky One. So I'd, I'd done a TV show on Sky One before, so I got in touch with their um, commissioning editors and the subject line in that, because I saw on Twitter, he had written, I would never hire anyone that punched a fellow employee in the face. So my subject line in my email to him was, I don't punch people in the face, <laughs> just because I wanted to get his attention, right? And then in the subject, in the body of the email, I was like, listen, Top Gear, is like, I don't know if it's coming to an end or what, but maybe Sky want to do a car show. Um, we kind of know each other. I think I'd be great for it. If you're considering doing a car show, then um, get in touch. And they did, they got in touch, but they, you know, they weren't doing a car show at the time. What did they say? They said, um, love the subject line, really got my attention. Um, and if we ever do a car show, we're going to get in touch with you um, to, to see if anything's possible. It never worked out that way. But as it happened, Top Gear got in touch and yeah, they, they called me up to do a screen test. What did they say when they got in touch? Well, I remember feeling like really nervous. You know when you get a call from like a job interview or um, maybe like a crush, <laughs> you get someone's number and they call you and it flashes up on the screen. You're like, oh, it's happening, <laughs> it's happening. So it was a bit like that. And they started asking me like, pretty much like loads of questions, like loads of personal questions, loads of career questions, even things like, what's your favorite sweets? What's your favorite crisps? You know, things like that. And everything they asked me felt like a test. And yeah. it felt like if I answer this incorrectly, <laughs> like they're just gonna hang up the phone. And I'll just... So cryptic. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, they said, listen, we want you to come in and do a screen test on Monday, the 7th of September, this was back in 2015. Hmm. I remember feeling like, wow. It's finally on. It's happening. And with that, I asked Rory to take me back to that autumn day by stopping off at the place where his Top Gear adventure began. So this was it. Home base. This is where Top Gear was filmed. So you got the big hangar over there. That was the studio. And this is where all the cars would arrive that we test on track. And that was the office where all the planning happened. They had the green room for all the talent. You can even see the helmets are still there. So tell me about the screen test. What was that like? Quite nerve wracking. So I remember like the day leading up to the screen test, I played Eminem Lose Yourself nonstop. And um, I rocked up. The first thing they wanted me to do was a walk around of a Golf GTI in the studio because they wanted to see what I looked like in that setting. And it was the Top Gear studio. You walked in, the logo's there, the cameras are there, the lights are there, the people are there. And um, I remember them apologizing because they didn't have an auto cue. And I was like, no problem, because I've been drilling it into my head. They actually sent me half a script and I had to write the other half of it. And it was all drilled in my head, knocked it out, one take. And I remember thinking, the only way is down from here because that went as good, as good as it could have gone. And then I walked in there and I was kind of faced with the next step, which was to actually drive a car on track, which was the bit that I was quite nervous about. I remember seeing, there's a guy called um, Tom Ford, Wookie. He was a presenter on Fifth Gear and a writer on Top Gear magazine. And I went up to him trying to get with Intel, you know, I was like, listen, um, what's the crack? How's everyone doing? Like, what do you need from people? And he was like, mm. Everyone's all right, but no one's, no one's really like sending it. Everyone's just like taking it a bit easy and a bit safe. I was like, right, say no more. 
I know what that means. That, that means you've got to go out there and absolutely drive the pants off this car. And that made me even more nervous because you don't just deliver your lines, you've got to drive like you see on the TV show as well. It's scary. That's where Matt LeBlanc had his um, Winnebago. So he had a uh, special treatment. He would have huh. his like five star stuff. Me and Chris were in the far corner. So I guess you didn't see any of the old presenters then? No, nah, they were long gone by then. But tell you what, the first time I walked in there, you could almost feel the presence of these old guys. Walking in there, it felt like walking into someone else's living room and seeing all their stuff and all their dodgy collection of, you know, <laughs> stuff that you don't want to see. Yeah. <laughs> the first episode I did, I remember seeing, I think there were about 800 people who came to watch the show, the first episode that I was involved with. And they all, like, I, could, I was in that building and I watched them all file in. And I remember my heart just going. It was crazy. But yeah, super nerve wracking. But once you're doing it, you're doing it, you know? Sink or swim. Wow. And what about the first time that you were given a car and, and had to drive through these gates knowing that you were about to come out and do your first yeah. top gear, like official top gear lap? So in the screen test, yeah. that was a Mercedes C63. They'd rigged up all the cameras in it. I walked through these gates and they were like, jump in, you got 15 minutes, show us what you got. All right, come on then Rory, show me what you got. <laughs> Pressure's on now. <laughs> so they wanted you to drift? Yeah. And could you? I know you can now. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure you couldn't back then. I, I genuinely, I, because I was a motoring journalist, I could drive. So I'd had lots of tuition on tracks with instructors at high speed and I could control the car. But the way that you were expected to drive in those situations isn't to just jump in to someone's Porsche or Aston Martin and slide it about because it's not set up for that, those mm. events, you know? They're, they're there for you to understand the car and get the most from them and for you to go, right, I'm just gonna switch off the traction control and send it into a corner. No one's gonna do that for you. So the only drifting experience I had was when I borrowed a Ferrari and I took it to a little crusty test track. I think it was at the Haynes Museum. And uh, me and my cameraman were filming something and I just started like playing about with it and I was doing some sliding, doing some spinning, and generally just destroying the tires. Um, so no is the short answer. <laughs> yeah. But when you've got all these people, cameramen all around the track, and you've got all the producers watching you on binoculars or whatever, it's sink or swim. That is serious pressure. <laughs> it really is. And I bet there were loads of them as well, right? Yeah, I mean, every corner, every single corner, and it's not just about concentrating on them, it's concentrating on saying the words. So what I did was I thought, let me take the first couple of laps, because I've never driven the track before. Mm -hmm. Let me take the first couple of laps, medium speed, get my words out, and then once I've got the words out, I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> so deliver the lines, one take, and, I, and at the end of it, I remember thinking, wow, okay, you nailed that. Now concentrate on the driving. And I just, I just literally threw it into Chicago, threw it into Hammerhead, and s somehow the car was sticking and doing what it was supposed to. And I remember watching the footage back <laughs> and it was really cool. It was really cool. Did you know or did you think you'd done enough? So at the end of it, the thing that I felt was pride more than anything. I was proud of myself that I'd made it onto the Top Gear test track which is a place that not many people get to drive, first of all, and that I did a good job. I, I, I aced my lines, or so I thought. Um, I aced the driving, which was the major thing that I was kind of worried about. And I left here, like, beaming from ear to ear because I, think, I, I was thinking to myself, I got this, I really got this. I even saw Chris Harris, he was here on the same day. I remember looking at him thinking, I feel really bad because that dude ain't gonna get it. <laughs> Oh it sounds cocky, but you know when you feel like when you do yeah. a test, and at the end of the test, sometimes you can feel like um, I didn't do good there. But yeah. sometimes you walk out the room thinking, yeah, yeah nah, fair play. I knew I knew what I was doing. That's how I felt. But it turned out Rory didn't get the job. Weeks later, he received a message from the production team saying he hadn't been chosen. But not being one to give up, he took matters into his own hands. So you're back again, huh? I told you never leave me. I wanted you for myself. I was cold and I was greedy, emotional, needy. 
I seen you drive past a couple times, I suppose you never seen me. I wouldn't dare dismiss you, I care and miss you. Ain't nobody else comparing with you. I ain't moved since you left me, I've been here and sit you. So much in common, we even share initials. But we had our fling. I remember when you came forth in wraith form, God, the time just goes. This time it's ghost. I wax lyrical about you every time I spoke. So this time it's prose, rhymes and flows to convey my feelings about a ride this dope. Well, I've never seen a review like that. What made you do it like bit, that? A bit different, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what? It was a bit of a, a rescue mission, I think. Because you get so far and you get turned down, I felt like I had to do something to turn it back around. I actually had a friend, shout out to Paul, um, good friend of mine, um, he texted me and said, have you got that job yet? And I was like, nah, mate, they turned me down. They said no. And he just as calm as you like said, change their minds. And I was like, is this guy off his trolley? Like, is he nuts? They've said no to me. And he was just like, no, nah, change their minds. So I was like, okay, what can I do to change their minds? So um, I actually emailed them and said, you know, what was, what was the issue? And then they went, you're all great. We just, we just don't think it's, it's, it's for everyone. So to me, that meant I had to do something to stand out a bit. So I called up Rolls Royce. I said, uh, give me any car you got. Like, I need it really, really quickly. And I wrote this like spoken word poetry thing, yeah. shot it with two of my mates, edited it myself. So then I emailed the lady at the BBC who had actually turned me down. And I said, oh, I made this video. I think it'd be really cool if you check it out. And if our paths cross again in the future, you know, great, so be it. That was at 8 p.m. By 6 a.m., she'd watched the video and emailed me saying, I'm gonna put this in front of people. Eight hours later, I got a phone call and she said, you're a Top Gear presenter. No. That was it. No. And if I hadn't have done that video, if I'd have just said, if, I'd have, if I didn't listen to my mate who said, change, who said change their minds and I, and I just accepted it, none of that would have happened. You must have learnt so much from that moment. It all comes down to perseverance, like mm. believing in yourself um, and having the right people around you as well. You don't necessarily need someone who's going to give you every single piece of advice laid out in front of you. But when you've got someone in, in your corner that believes in you, that just says, go succeed, then sometimes that's all you need. And, you know, I say that to people all the time. If you're passionate enough about something, go get it. So what was that call like? <sighs> ah, <laughs> life changing, I think. I remember I mean, not just the call, but or everything that happened after it. So I got a call from um, Chris Evans. He was like, oh, I'm down the pub. Come down the pub, come and meet me. And um, he was there, Harris was there, a bunch of producers was, was, were there, like the big bosses were there. Everyone's like having a few beers after work. And I was like, wow. Um, and someone took a picture and um, it was in the newspaper. And, um, and, and I couldn't say anything at that point, but it was like, it was official. And then I remember that, like, on a Monday morning, hearing my name being read out on the radio, because they were listing every single, like, new presenter. And I was taking the bins out. <laughs> and I sort of collapsed on the, on the kitchen floor, like, in, I guess, joy. I was just overwhelmed, because, like, from that moment, life, like, life obviously wouldn't ever be the same. Wow. And then what? Like, what was that then like? Do you know what? It was such a whirlwind because it happened pretty quickly. Um, like it was just overwhelming. There was a lot of obviously work to be done. Um, they offered me extra gear, my own little spin-off show, and everything was moving a million miles an hour. Mm. But the, I guess the tricky part was adjusting to those changes because like you had like media attention, you had mm. like journalists knocking on your door, on your friends and family's door. Mm. I had to make my circle a lot smaller actually because I, I kept seeing like pictures from my Facebook appearing in like tabloids and I was like who's like selling photos of me mm. to the newspapers so it was, I, me. Sorry, was it you I hope you got paid very well I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was a grand pop it was a <laughs> so yeah I had to like literally just like shrink back into myself a little bit and that was probably one of the most difficult moments actually wow yeah that's like a real pro and the pros and cons, I guess, of, of that massive life change. Yeah, exactly. Because you can never be the same person again, almost. You've always got to watch yourself. I actually, I rang you a couple of times, yeah, moaning yeah. about like yeah. how stressful it was yeah, at yeah. times. I remember though, like a couple of pictures being released and you being like, it's just not portraying me in the light that 
it was intended. I, I had two shotguns. That's right. Yeah, that was the <laughs> that was the one. And you're like there, looking like a rude boy. With yeah, two yeah, yeah, guns. yeah. And they just tore that to pieces. Yeah, and of course that makes you look a certain way to to the people, right? Yeah. Um, totally taken out of context, but I mean, it was it was a tough a tough time, but at the same time, like super exciting because we had work to do. Yeah. <laughs> And then, so then, what was it like then working with the others? Um, it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. I was super excited. The thing that maybe was a bit kind of disappointing was that I grew up watching Top Gear and I assumed that all the guys were mates and they would go out for drinks at the pub after every shoot or whatever. But it wasn't really like that. It was more like a job, you know? Like you'd, you'd rock up, you'd do your filming, and then people would like go there, go there, disappear. And I was like, oh. We're not like three amigos anymore, that's gone. Mm. But we had to earn that over time. We had to build that rapport amongst each other um, and build that friendship. So you did this show for three years. Do you have any regrets? Nah, none at all, none at all. It wasn't all like sunshine and rainbows, like how people might look at it from the outside, might think it was. Mm. It was, it was work, it was a job, but it was a job that I loved and a job I'm still doing having left the show. So I, yeah, I enjoyed every every moment of it even the bits that maybe weren't you know the nicest bits mm. it was all part of an experience that I, i'd never never take back so why did you leave that's a great question so matt left he wanted to be closer to his daughter and his family he was com commuting like across the atlantic so the gang kind of broke up from that point and um, the bbc had to kind of rebuild the team but what they had for me was a new role covering the evolution of electric cars, the next generation of vehicles. Um, and I was still part of the Top Gear family. But I got this incredible offer from Auto Trader, um, total kind of editorial freedom. They told me, go and build a channel for us in the way that you want to do it. Like, use your creativity, use your vision, do what you do best to create the next generation of Auto Trader. And it was such a big name as well, Auto Trader, right? Mm. Huge, that I couldn't, I couldn't say no to it. No. I've got a question for you, actually. Why, why are you wearing odd socks? <laughs> because it's lucky. How is wearing odd socks lucky? I don't know. Lucky, lucky or lazy? <laughs> lucky. I can't wear matching socks. Like, really can't. I didn't know this about you. What if you pick up two socks that match automatically? Do you just, you just chuck one away? No, I turn one inside out. You are absolutely nuts. Absolute fact. <laughs> I have to have odd socks on. How weird. <laughs> All right, fine. Fair enough. Right, back in the car. Yep. What um, are we doing? I've got another round for you. More questions, yeah? Yep. All right, let's do it. Right, I want a fast lap and fast answers. Okay, let's do it. Ready? Yep. Okay. Clarkson, how or May? Oh, uh... Fast. May, May. Oh, interesting. Harris or LeBlanc? Rory. <laughs> well, yeah, fair play. Can you actually answer it? Um, no, I'm not going to comment on that. Oh, I, li I like them the same. Oh, whatever. Okay, P1, 918 or LaFerrari? Do you know what? The first day I turned up at a shoot here, Chris Evans tossed me the keys to his LaFerrari and goes, drive it. Um, but I'd have to say uh, P1. What's the best place you've been to in Top Gear? Uh, I've been to Cuba, that's probably the best place. Oh, okay. Most exciting place though was Kazakhstan because we got to see a rocket launch. Best memory from Top Gear? Um, probably, I'd say it's a tie. Seeing the rocket go up into space because we were right on the launch pad at Baikonur, that was incredibly special. And also going around the Nürburgring with Sabine, oh, that yeah. was unforgettable. Legend. Uh, least favourite memory? Ooh, um, I don't know, do you know what? I don't, I don't think I have one. <laughs> Genuinely, I enjoyed the majority of my time there. Oh, Maybe cute. all the extra press stuff that goes along with it, I'd say. I didn't enjoy that, yeah. like not seeing friends again. That we, you know, It was all a bit of a stressful time in, in places. Um, did you ever crash? I never crashed. That's not true. Genuinely, I've never crashed. For not, real? not on Top Gear, no. I mean, they put me in situations where I very nearly crashed. Like, for example, my first shoot was in a Ford Mustang up in um, Scotland right. and the director goes right Rory drift around this hairpin up, up a mountain and I'm like you've never been in a car with me you've never seen me drive before and you're saying to drift around this hairpin on a mountain um, yeah but no one died yeah it was all good 
Uh, who was the most annoying person on the show? <laughs> That's a good one. Do you know what? Eddie Jordan, but in, in a good way, because he'd rock up to your hotel room and start playing the spoons and start just <laughs> jamming out randomly. Um, which, if you're trying to learn your lines or something, is maybe unwanted, but yeah, no, he's, he's, he's brilliantly hilarious. Least favourite presenter from your time? You're going to have to wait for the book. Ah. <laughs> would you would you go back? Do you know what? I feel like that period in my life is done. I feel like I'm still doing the same stuff that I love doing on Top Gear, minus a few of the headaches, shall we say. So do I want to go back to the headaches? I don't know. I always say look forward, never look back. Yeah. Could you do that now, please? <laughs> <laughs> YouTube or TV? <laughs> I'd say I love doing TV, but YouTube is the one, definitely. More freedom, more fun. You can interact directly with people. We can talk to the people watching you. Yeah. So yeah, YouTube all day. Okay, can we stop now? Because I'm going to vomit. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, why don't I ask you a couple of questions then? Oh, okay. Um, so tell me about your podcast. What's it called? It's called Show on the Road. Yep. It, and what's the what's when's it go out? So it started on the 18th of June and so far three episodes have gone out. So we've had Gogglebox and I'm a Celeb Star, Scarlet Moffat, Lioness, Jill Scott and Love Island voiceover sensation Ian Sterling. And we've got five more to go and it comes out on Wednesdays. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. So I interview celebrities in a car that we have matched with them yep. based on their lives or either their childhood favourite cars or their dream car or something okay. that reminds them of their childhood. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, it sounds great. Um, I'm going to tune in. I've actually already heard an episode. It's pretty good. If you guys want to check out Show on the Road, make sure you download it in all the places you find your podcasts. Should we go faster? Yes. Thank you.